Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the USC's Architecture Fall 2021 Lecture Series. Although our event is virtual tonight, the University of Southern California is sited in Tovangar, the unceded and occupied traditional lands of the Tongva and Gavrilino peoples who have lived and continue to live here in relationship with their homeland. My name is Bi Zhang. I'm the Citizen Architect Fellow at USC this year. And on behalf of the School of Architecture, I am thrilled to be in community with you all and to introduce our esteemed guest, Karen Mack. Following her lecture, we will moderate a brief question and answer session, so please submit your questions via the Q&A function throughout the event. Karen Mack is the founder and executive director of LA Commons, an arts organization that helps communities tell their stories uh, and artists to create dynamic works of public art. A lifelong Angelino, her work focuses on issues of civic engagement and creative placekeeping, and we are so pleased and honored to share space with her today. 20 years ago, Karen Mack created the South LA-based nonprofit LA Commons. Uh, and since that time, she and her team have worked in neighborhoods across the city, implementing artistic programs that foster interaction, dialogue, and collaboration for a better Los Angeles. LA Commons plays a unique role as a facilitator of local engagement in arts and culture, as well as in other important issues, health, transportation, and education, just to name a few, giving residents and particularly young people a voice and an on-ramp to making positive change. Prior to work with LA Commons, she served as a public service fellow at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, where she researched the role of culture in community building. Uh, Karen Mack holds a master's in public administration from Harvard University and a master's in business administration from the John Anderson School of Management at the University of California, Los Angeles. And she is currently a mayoral appointee to the City of Los Angeles Planning Commi uh, Commission, excuse me, on the Equity Subcommittee Chair and supervi uh, Supervisorial Appointee and Co-Chair for LA County's Cultural Equity and Inclusion Initiative. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight, Karen Mack. I'm so looking forward to your talk and I'm sure everyone else here is as well. So I will turn it over to you at this point. Thank you so much for having me, Bees. Thanks for that great uh, introduction. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here. We've uh, been uh, developing great relationships with uh, some of the team here at the School of Architecture. I wanna give a shout out to Allison. Um, and uh, uh, so I just see this as part of our ongoing partnership. Um, I, I gather that, um, you know, there is a real interest in uh, really, uh, you know, moving the needle in terms of architecture for the people. And so, um, and we, we actually got to partner with some other students. Um, uh, I forgot about that partnership uh, earlier this year as well. So excited, excited to be here. So I'm gonna share my screen. Of course, I'm at the last. Uh, getting a preview. <laughs> okay, so um, some people want to be long so badly that they are willing to risk dying for it. I actually grew up in Compton, uh, uh, but it wasn't uh, the growing up that you might expect. Um, uh, really, I kind of lived in the archetypal village. Um, I had a two parent, this is like a little spread of me when I was in my growing up years. Uh, I had two parent household and neighbors looking after neighbors, Girl Scout troops and birthday parties, uh, swing sets in the backyard and carpool rides to my parochial schools. And I have to say that, that picture in the bottom right, I, I always love when I come across that one, you know you have disposable income when you can do a Tom Thumb wedding for the seven year olds. Um, so uh, I uh, had a pretty great growing up 
with community and support. And um, I'm, I'm sure it's contributed mildly to you know, where I am today. Uh, when I was 15 though, I became a lifeguard at a pool in Watts. And uh, you know, what I saw there gave me a window into another kind of upbringing where you didn't have a sense of community. Um, where you didn't have necessarily the support I had. And I believe really my inspiration to this day is really recognizing that feeling loved and feeling supported and that you belong is the foundation for personal agency, not to mention, you know, our democracy. I mean, goodness knows we have witnessed in recent years the deterioration of this national connectedness and continue to experience dire consequences. So it's with this in mind that uh, a little over 20 years ago, I started LA Commons, which is uh, which we have the mission of engaging communities and artistic and cultural expression that tell their unique stories and serve as a basis for dialogue, interaction, and a shared understanding of Los Angeles. Um, we, our values uh, are around opportunity, equity, and collaboration. At the foundation of our work is a desire to further opportunity for all by supporting communities to make their places more just, healthy, and livable. Because discrimination has been a key factor in creating the challenges faced by our neighborhood, promoting equity is integral to all that we do through collaboration with local partners with whom we have built deep wells of trust, we leverage art and cultural approaches to create positive change. Uh, when I um, uh, was getting LA Commons started, I had the chance to study with Robert Putnam at Harvard. He wrote this book, Bowling Alone, which uh, is a classic, just republished uh, uh, a couple of years ago um, that really delved into this idea of social capital, um, which uh, uh, you may know is a concept around the trust that binds us together and really in a neighborhood uh, is a valuable quantity because it really does contribute to the success of local places. And at the base of that idea really is this interaction between people. It's only when people come into contact with each other and have the chance to do things together that those, those bonds of trust developed. Now, clearly things have devolved since 2000 in many ways. And interestingly, I think this actually validates what Putnam has been theorizing all these years, which is, you know, we, we actually have a lot of bonding capital, you know, the society is so factionalized, but what we don't have is the social capital that bridges the different groups. And so, um, you know, that, that, is, that is really our challenge. And just last year, he actually with Shailen Romney Garrett, published another book really responding to the moment that we're in called The Upswing, How America Came Together a Century Ago and How We Could Do It Again. And they really put together an incredible data set to, to study what has gone on over the years in terms of America's connectedness. Uh, and 125 years, as, as a matter of fact, our information society has been very beneficial in this regard. Um, and this is, this I think is probably the most important slide in the book, which really talks about community versus individualism. And, you know, the higher on this graph, the more, more sense of community in America. And you can see like in the 60s, in the mid 60s, going into the 70s, that was, that was, uh, you know, our highest point. And um, so, uh, you know, the, the beginning of it is in the time of the Gilded Age, which we are in another Gilded Age right now. And I'm going to read you what a quote from the book uh, that talks about what the Gilded Age was. Gross extremes of wealth and poverty, a tattered social fabric rife with factionalism and nativism, 
a gridlocked public square and a culture of narcissism were its hallmarks. The late 1800s was thus by nearly every measure, including the stark retrenchment of national racial equality, the worst of times. And, you know, it sort of feels like that right now that we're like, could it get any worse? I'm not sure. Um, uh, I think what's encouraging about their argument is you see that, you know, from that nadir, there actually was upward, um, uh, you know, an upward trajectory. Unfortunately, it stopped and then it started going back down. I mean, we all know, I think, that things are cyclical and that's what this looks like um, to me. So it's actually pretty hopeful in terms of, um, you know, the, the opportunity to, um, to, you know, go anywhere, but, you know, go up. I mean, we can't go anywhere, but up, I think, right now. So, um, but what, what led to that uh, upward trend was progressive, progressivism, which, um, or the progressive era, which, um, you know, there was all of this activism to make society better for everyone. So during that time, you know, the late 18th to the, uh, uh, to the 1930s, you had, you know, unions mobilizing, you had protections for workers coming out of the government, workers and consumers, and women finally achieved the right to vote during that time. So it was a pretty uh, powerful moment. Now, um, uh, what they say is we Americans have gotten ourselves out of a mess remarkably similar to the one we're in now by rediscovering the spirit of community that has defined our nation from its inception. America has turned the tide from I to we once before and we can do it again. Now, I do have to take a little issue with this uh, as an African-American and thinking about that time period uh, in American history when um, you, you know, we now have a whole museum dedicated to lynching of black people uh, which was a lot of it took place during that time. Um, and then we also know that Jim Crow, Crow was, you know, alive and well. And we had people basically fleeing the South because, uh, you know, it was so brutal for them after, you know, this, this uh, redemption that Southern whites put in place to, to bring Black people back into, you know, their station in life. So, so it is a little, a little bit problematic the, um, the uh, idea that, you know, it was a full we, um, but I have to say that my parents, if I look at my parents, my dad always says that he came up during exactly the right moment. And it really is true. He was born in 1925. He's 96 right now. Um, and he, um, you know, they, they had everything. I mean, they, I showed you the lifestyle. They had a middle-class lifestyle. Uh, they both worked. Um, uh, they actually met at Douglas Aircraft and then went on to other careers. And um, so, so things were pretty good. Uh, you know, that, that it's like I was born right at the, at the, at the apex of that curve. And then things started to go um, downhill from there. Um, so, so there's, you know, so he's not totally wrong, but, you know, there is some, you know, you, you cannot talk about people of color doing well in the 20th century in America fully because, you know, that's not true. Um, here's a, a model about social capital from our social cohesion. They extend it. It's from a report called We Making from Policy Link, which Policy Link is really the gold standard in terms of equity. Angela Glover Blackwell was really on the vanguard of this equity conversation in America. So, you know, they really understand uh, what it means to do social capital, you know, in a racially diverse society. And, um, you know, I, I really, I actually appreciate this chart a lot because, you know, our work is sometimes a little bit difficult to explain. And so this in, in some ways really gets it. And so they are talking about social cohesion and they actually talk both about social capital and civic engagement in this uh, model 
And, uh, you know, so you, you bring the two together and it's really the social cohesion that allows for that coordinated community organizing activity that drives change in neighborhoods. Um, and so, uh, you know, art and culture is really the a vehicle to amplify those drivers of social cohesion and really enable people to, to develop that trust. You see trust is in the middle. That is the most important thing. And we find that in every single neighborhood we work in that that is the, 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 the realm, uh, you know, the coin of the realm in order for us to be successful in our projects. Um, and so um, what I'm gonna do now is just tell you some stories that really bring uh, these concepts to life. So now we're going to travel to Hyde Park, and um, you see it's not that far from where I grew up in Compton, and I was a lifeguard in Watts. And uh, Ermius Joseph Ashendam grew up not far from where I was in Hyde Park, but it might as well have been a thousand miles away. He was actually born on the downslope of uh, Professor Putnam's chart uh, in 1985. And uh, so he, I mean, he could have been almost, I mean, he's a little young, but he could have been one of those kids I was teaching swim lessons to in the pool in Watts. Um, by then, the village didn't have a chance because you had tremendous job uh, removal from the manufacturing sector from uh, the area. So the jobs went away and then you had the crack cocaine epidemic so, you know, and all that exploded in 1992 and the rebellion. So, you know, so that opportunity to have that foundational connectedness was not uh, really available. Um, and so, but uh, this young man really, you know, was industrious selling mixtapes out of his trunk. So he's an artist and he really, uh, uh, represents the energy in that part of town at Slauson and Crenshaw, which is, you know, kind of ground zero for this hustle entrepreneurship. And he actually built an empire from those beginnings and ultimately opened a brick and mortar store uh, at the intersection of Slauson and Crenshaw that, you know, symbolized his love for the neighborhood and, and desire to continue to give back even though he was doing well. And Ermius, of course, was Nipsey Hussle. Um, and I, he's an interesting case study because one of the questions I was asked to speak about was this idea of the creative economy and culture and, and the role of artists in uh, you know, gentrification and other ills within neighborhoods. But he's an interesting case study because he's deeply embedded in the neighborhood and rather than being a detriment, is really adding value to um, uh, his, his hometown. So I'm going to play a video for you. <coughs> and I have to warn you, it has strong language, but it's such a cool document of Nipsey Hussle, uh, having people talk about him and how they feel about him in the neighborhood, and then having him sing his song, uh, sing, I put singing in quotes, uh, Crenshaw and Slauson, and it really is a documentation of his life. So I'm just going to play it and then I'll move around a little bit. This is uh, Anthem, Crenshaw and Slauson. And you, you can find this online if you want to watch the whole thing. It's just Crenshaw and Slauson. I think if you search in Nipsey Hustle, you'll be able to find it. I'm not going to play the whole song but i'll play and really try and listen listen uh you know to the words there it's a little hard to make up but if you listen okay um oop. why did i do that i'm gonna share again um sharing the screen right oh what happened Sorry guys, a little technical. Oh, here it is. <laughs> I'm pretty sure a lot of shit that he went through, we, we going, going through right now. I just want to stop the video and move to the next slide. Come on, Karen, get it together. Okay, so um, so 
really, uh, you know, his challenge, you know, this goes back to what I said earlier. I mean, he was, uh, you know, a gang member in addition to uh, being this very well-regarded artist. And so, um, you know, he lived uh, that lifestyle that was really, I mean, you know, belonging is obviously a really important aspect of that life. And so, um, you know, he was willing to take that risk uh, uh, in order to be part of something. And so, um, you know, it was interesting. The woman said that he, he made it out and he didn't make it out actually. He was, he succumbed, you know, on the eve of his success to, you know, the challenge in a community where you don't have the village, where you don't have a strong sense of community. Um, uh, so um, uh, this uh, stop uh, that is, well, we are, Work, we worked in that, on, in that intersection, uh, Slauson and Crenshaw, you know, featured prominently in that artwork, um, that rap song. Um, and uh, it is a very prominent intersection because it was a former metro, or former train stop. Uh, you can see the historic train line um, in the right, and then it's going to be a stop on the current Metro, uh, the Crenshaw LAX line. And so Metro came to us and asked us to partner on to do a, uh, this is the intersection here, um, to do a project uh, that would, um, you know, sort of be a transit connection, uh, an art project. And you see the bank, uh, the US bank in the right hand corner, that is where we ended up doing our project. Now it was no, by no means guaranteed that we would actually do it on that bank, but we knew this intersection was really important. And I don't know if you noticed in the, vid in the, uh, in the video, but Nipsey Hussle was uh, rapping in front of his, uh, in front of the, the, uh, the strip mall that he, he owned. Um, and that is diagonally across from that bank. Um, so what we did in uh, building this project was to really um, focus on social cohesion in the neighborhood, which we always do. And uh, in this case, we weren't starting from scratch. We had, uh, there's tremendous um, uh, energy in terms of civic engagement among the elders, um, you know, people who were uh, born on the upswing in terms of that, uh, that chart uh, from, from the, the book, The Upswing. Um, and so uh, they were incredible partners actually. Um, with their engagement, we recruited artists who were local or nearby uh, youth, recruited youth and mentored them, uh, found sites to do workshops, events, uh, and, um, you know, and ultimately the mural site. Um, and this is the amazing mural that was created through all of that energy. Um, and it is now a gateway mural, a crowning accomplishment um, having gotten approved by U.S. Bank, and I cannot tell you how difficult it is to get a corporation to support uh, a project like this, um, but it really was, you know, this is a perfect example of what was um, illustrated in that the policy link chart of the community really developing trust, you know, they had to trust us, we had the you know, they had to trust each other and then uh, do the work needed to actually get this mural uh, completed um, and uh, on, on this building facade. Um, and uh, the process was uh, wonderful, um, you know, intensive on some level, but really you can see the students working. There were 12 youth involved. Um, that looks like more than 12, but there were uh, that was the, the cohort. And um, 
and then uh, and then the youth involved the community, as you can see on the right, over 100 community members were involved, all sharing their stories, their images, their ideas, and the mural was the result. Um, the, that's Moses Ball, who's the artist uh, in the bottom right. He's a wonderful, uh, he was a wonderful leader for the team and, you know, was really um, instrumental in that trust building, uh, really listening to the community. I think that's number one in that, that uh, you know, the, in the ability to do successful and uh, efficacious work in the community is really listening to the community. And uh, so uh, uh, he has something, you know, to be, he is extremely proud of this project because of his amazing work on it. Um, sadly, just before the mural's completion, you know, in that parking lot of the strip mall, Nipsey Hussle was gunned down. And um, it, just so tragic because, you know, he loved the community so much. And uh, so, and this happened just day, it, this happened so close to the opening, it was ridiculous. And, but the team really wanted to have him included because, uh, you know, he was such an important uh, member of the community, as you heard from the folks who spoke earlier. Um, and so what happened was, um, there was a friend of a friend who had a connection to his mother who actually showed up at the painting site and gave her permission for hand wrote a note giving her permission for his likeness to be included in the mural. And as Moses put it, with our brother Nipsey Hustle being shot just across the street, I felt like this mural was kind of like a fitting memorial. And it really has become a memorial. You'll see people taking selfies in front of it. And the community actually owns it and gives tours. Um, it's really, you know, of course this is all pre-COVID, but um, you know, it's really a landmark in the community. And you know, uh, uh, it, it is is a memorial to the heart of Hyde, the true heart of Hyde Park, which are those people who make the neighborhood special, the famous, and more importantly, the not so famous, the ordinary, extraordinary people of Hyde Park. Um, so during my lifeguarding days, I actually trained at Fremont High School, which is located in the Florence neighborhood, which is circled there on the map, on this version of the map. And I think one of the coolest things <clears throat> about my job is that I get to visit, uh, you know, revisit all these places that uh, were uh, part of my childhood, part of my youth, and, and focus on having a positive impact. And I get to do it by leveraging the power of art. <clears throat> One of our board members is a scholar named Maria Rosario Jackson. She is the Institute Professor at the Herberger Institute for Art and Design at ASU. And, and really widely viewed as an expert in the role of culture in urban development. Uh, she speaks of culture as an often overlooked but necessary aspect of urban infrastructure. And this quote uh, summarizes that. So she says, in community development, we need to help people to divest themselves from narrow interpretations of what artists and designers are capable of doing and help them see that communities that people think of as bereft or vacuous, in fact, have a culture that may not be completely legible but is nonetheless rich and robust and worthy of attention and lifting up. Learning to see is almost, or listen, I would say, I would add listen too, is almost a precondition for any way of doing this work well. Can you imagine artists and culture bearers contributing in ways beyond the making of widgets or the production of entertainment? So I, um, we are, working at Fremont High School in uh, just this vein, um, I'm gonna show you a um, video right now of that project and then I'll tell you about it after the video is complete. Wow. 
So that was the Fremont High School Wellness Center, which is this amazing hub at Fremont High School. That is, that is a place for not just students and families at the high school, but the entire community. And so we're engaged in this project with all of these amazing partners, including the Spatial Adet Kim and the Spatial Analysis Lab at USC um, to integrate art and culture into the activities there, which you see are gardening, uh, there's a health clinic there um, and uh, uh, other amenities, a greenhouse that that really, you know, are uh, it's an incredible resource in this part of the city. And we have a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. And uh, together, we're really focused on mapping. You notice Maria talked about the assets and uh, you know, not just thinking about widgets and uh, entertainment, we're mapping the cultural resources in the neighborhood that have the opportunity to bring wellness uh, to the site. Artists, uh, healers, other cultural bearers. And, and you know, this idea really um, is an idea of our times. I think the, the uh, proposal was recovery and resilience because, you know, we all know that BIPOC communities really suffered tremendously as during the pandemic. And this is an opportunity to really align uh, uh, the health, the wellness services with uh, folks in the community and have them really decide what wellness means to them. So thinking about these cultural resources and integrating them in the health clinic, thinking about food that comes in and healing, herbs that could potentially come from the garden, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're really excited about, you know, in getting the community engaged in uh, doing the outreach for the, um, the asset mapping and then really helping to determine who, what makes the most sense to bring to that site to, to serve them. Um, and uh, uh, the, um, the um, public art that we did, oh, this is the site. So you can see that, um, you know, you have the garden beds, you have the clinic on the bottom uh, left sort of, um, and the greenhouse at the top. So it's just, I mean, when you're there, uh, it, you, you just can't believe how, how gorgeous it is. Um, and so we did two projects there, one in 2019 and one in 2020. You saw the medallions that we were putting up on the fences. Uh, and as part of that project, you know, the generations came together to tell stories. This is in the garden space and um, uh, you know, what it, and to, to envision what health looks like uh, for them. And so um, 2019 and then 2020, during the pandemic, we created more medallions because people love them so much. And so this project that we're about to embark on is an extension of this activity and, you know, has the, um, we have the opportunity to, to even deepen further the social cohesion that's been developed and, you know, um, uh, uh, further the agency of the community and thinking about what it really wants and needs to ensure that, you know, there, there is health and wellness uh, available to everyone. I have to say about this community, it's interesting because I said that I swam at Fremont, you know, a long time ago and 
at that point, Fremont was, uh, that part of the city was mostly African-American. At this point, uh, South LA is 70% uh, Latinx and 30% African-American. So it's a very different population. And I think one of the challenges of doing work in uh, communities that are immigrant are really thinking about how to welcome immigrants into any situation. And I think that's an issue for Los Angeles in general when we think about social cohesion and we really should focus more energy in, um, you know, how do we uh, tap and embrace this incredible immigrant energy that we are, um, we benefit from. More pictures from the beautiful garden. Um, and they have food giveaway or food, like food distribution um, uh, at times. And this is one of the gorgeous medallions. So, um, you know, we have some beliefs, I think, that, that really align with what was um, presented in that policy link model, although ours are stated in a much more simple way because we are communicating with the general public about our work. Um, so firstly, we believe that everyone has the power to help meet the challenges facing our neighborhoods through our sense of connectedness with place and each other. Uh, culture is an essential community resource. All communities possess local knowledge and local assets. Artists have a leadership role to play in community development. This is the, the wonderful artist, Dominique Moody. Um, art is a powerful tool to share stories and create change. Uh, youth are vital participants in community development processes. Their energy, hope, and creativity transcends the limitations of the past to envision new futures. You know, as I, I, as I look towards uh, wrapping this up, I have to say, to be honest, uh, the last 18 months have been, you know, just wearying. Um, I'm sure you uh, certainly agree with this. I mean, to maintain my energy recently, I've just put myself on a news fast because at times things are so bleak and, you know, it's just, it's just hard to take. Um, but, but ultimately, I believe our situation is a gift and I'm not sure, I'm, I still wonder whether we have the wisdom to accept it because, I mean, we have an amazing chance to make the changes that we long for to create a more humane city, country and world, uh, but it, will, it takes courage to make the decisions. I mean, I'm, I'm in these conversations all the time and I see people waffling. I'm like, this is not the time to waffle. We need to move forward boldly. I mean, what gives me energy is seeing people of every stripe actually take charge of their situation, banding together, envisioning what they want and engaging in the process together to bring that vision to life, which is why I love what we do so much. Um, I'm energized by those neighbors in Hyde Park who are telling their story through art and you know, focus continually on making their places better. I'm energized by the folks from all around the city who come to testify at the planning commission uh, based on to advocate for the place they love. And mostly I'm energized by the young people that we work with who bring such optimism and verve to everything they do. Uh, with this in mind, we are working on this incredible initiative called Creating Our Next LA. And the idea is that we want to leverage that imaginative power of artists and youth to help us envision the future we want and to develop the advocacy platform to actually make it happen. I mean, next year is an incredibly transformative year. We're gonna elect a new mayor. We're gonna elect a new city council. I mean, several new city council people, city attorneys, city controller, as well as county supervisors, all their races up and down the ballot that um, we can uh, participate in, in order to uh, move forward what the change that we want. Um, story circles are at the heart of this work. Um, and uh, uh, we uh, had uh, in the spring, this amazing pilot for the project 
bringing together people in the story circle. You see Dominique Moody there on the second row in the middle. Um, and then that work got transformed into this incredible artwork. Um, the stories, uh, there's Dominique and some of the other artists involved. Um, and so um, the work is so loved and, and so well uh, uh, regarded that it's gonna be in the collection of CAM Museum. So we were all energized from being involved in this process and, you know, kind of this happened in May. We were, um, you know, just thinking about what we wanted to do next over the summer. And as luck would have it, we got a call from Yo-Yo Ma's team uh, who's exploring the same question. Uh, how can culture help us imagine, create, and build a better future than the one we are experiencing right now? So last week, we had this incredible day of action with him. There he is in the front next to me. Um, and uh, 20 movers and shakers from LA. I mean, it was an incredible group of people. And we put our heads together to think about you know, these questions um, and then to commit to actually moving forward, working together to move forward an agenda. Uh, Yo-Yo Ma says, the shared understanding that culture generates in these divisive times can bind us together as one world and guide us to political and economic decisions that benefit the entire species. We are all cultural beings Let's explore how culture connects us and can help to shape a better future. And so, you know, it's really like just we're doing creating our next LA and he's doing creating our next world. So the process is we're having story circles with partners and others who want to join us and do these story circles, create art to share stories. We're actually thinking about augmented reality as one way to bring them to life. Allison, uh, engage uh, donors public policymakers, et cetera, you know, in our policy platform once we figured out the next phase. And so we really, you know, I wanna close by just inviting you to join us in this incredible initiative that uses the power of artists, architects, uh, uh, youth and the broader community to envision the LA that we all will thrive in. And with that, I wanna thank you and I will close my presentation. Thank you so much, Karen. If we were in our lecture hall right now, it would be <laughs> so much applause and I'm seeing people in the chat uh, share their appreciation. Um, please continue to do so. Yeah, lots of thank yous, clapping. Thank you, that was incredible. Uh, we do have uh, questions. So I, I will um, just move us directly into the Q&A. Um, we have a first question from Lee who is asking, uh, as someone with a for-profit business, uh, where are the studies that prove the benefit uh, that corporations and cities do gain from an activated community? So we know there's a direct correlation between safety and better economics when culture is supported. Uh, Lee has run a cultural facility in Seattle for 20 years and um, so, you know, always trying to cash in that culture capital to expand opportunities for the music community, but coming up against basic bureaucratic systems that don't support what Lee does or actively doesn't recognize that business model as valid uh, or just doesn't fit within the bounds. So Lee is kind of asking about, is phil philanthropy the only um, alternative here? Business. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I get it. Um, I mean, I would say, like, is there an opportunity for partnership? I mean, that's really, I think, the way that we uh, move um, things forward with everybody. I mean, we're, <clears throat> we're always, um, whenever we go into a neighborhood, we're, uh, you know, that's really our MO is to think is to figure out who all the partners are. And uh, because that's the way you move things forward. It's very difficult to move any agenda forward as a singular organization. So why not as a business partner with, you know, nonprofits, with individual artists, with 
you know, whoever is in uh, the area, it sounds like they're, you're not based necessarily in LA, but, um, you know, I think that's a good start. Now, bureaucracy is no joke, I, I must admit, because I am, you know, within the city and I know how challenging it is to, uh, uh, you know, deal with um, getting the city to move anything, which is why, I mean, this is why we need creating our next LA because, you know, we we are the leaders. Like that is, we should be driving what happens right now because we know that the things are broken. So the and we know what needs to happen. So we we need to band together, and uh, you know, focus on moving the needle on the issues that we know are going to make our life in Los Angeles and and everywhere better. I hope I I, I don't know if I totally answered the question, but um, hopefully I gave a little insight. Absolutely. I think, I think, yeah, you've shared so many insights with us throughout the evening. Uh, I'll move us into the next question from Allison, uh, who you know. Uh, Karen, can you talk about how you started LA Commons? What made the moment right? You shared generously about what has inspired you to do this work, and we would love to know more about how it all began. There are a lot of students in here uh, in the virtual room that are energized and want to contribute to positive change. Thank you so much. Um, oh, thanks for thanks for that question, Allison. So, um, you know, I was <clears throat> I was really, um, you know, at a point in my life where I was really sick of, uh, uh, you know, focusing on someone else's mission. Like I, you know, I <clears throat> I really wanted to be myself in the world, and um, and so I just started planning. I just started thinking about there's, I always recommend this book. There's this fabulous book called Zen and the Art of Making a Living. And I actually, it has all these exercises. I actually did a retreat by myself in Joshua Tree. And I was like filling out all this um, information. And there's another book, you guys, you probably think I'm weird because it's kind of metaphysical, but it's called Creative Visualization, which I think visualization is like really a thing now because my daughter's therapist is actually having her do visualization. So so, um, so I actually visualized like what I wanted to have happen. Like it was just, you know, me and like people all over Los Angeles. And, and so, uh, you know, and, and I really, what that was part of, you know, beyond the metaphysical, which I do in some ways believe in that you create your own reality, um, is just kind of getting clear on what you want to do. So that's, you know, like, where is that nexus between what I'm good at and what the world needs? And obviously, you know, this connectedness is something that Los Angeles struggles with even more than other cities. So, so that's really what drove me to go in this direction was just trying to figure out how I could make a difference. And then, um, and then uh, you know, getting that support. So I actually got to go to Harvard and study with Robert Putnam, who was like the guru around social capital. And that was really helpful because he supported me in doing my plan. And, and you know, even like, you know, so, so what about the plan? I mean, I actually think planning in early stages is a little tricky. You want to do some planning, but, but really to get something started, you just got to start doing it because it's never going to go like you thought it would because it's never been done. So you have to start walking down the road and just kind of making it happen. And so, so that's what I did. Ultimately, you know, I did the biz, I did the plan with Robert Putnam, sort of thought about it, but then like serendipity kicks in. And I think that's also the benefit of actually figuring out what you're meant to do in the world because like you'll get support to do it like I would get these like I had no money like I had a job and I quit my job you know my husband was like what are you doing and so I quit my job and but then I got all these little jobs like I got all these little projects like the CRA hired me to be a public art uh, employee I mean I wasn't I was a consultant but like I was making money and, you know, just various things kicked in to like move things forward. And, um, you know, and then it just kind of materialized. And Beth Peterson, who's our community arts program director, I was doing research in, across the country and around the world looking at these kind of projects. And I met Beth and then she just happened to move to LA. Like, I didn't think I was ever gonna see this lady again. I just went to see that place one time. And then here she shows up in LA 
and she doesn't know anybody except me and one other person. So she's rolling up her sleeves to help me. So like I had an employee before I even had money. So, I mean, that's just, you know, the magic of intention, I think, and clarity. So. Thank you, absolutely. Thank, thank you for sharing all of that background um, and encouragement. I have another question. I'm going to encourage folks to to add more questions while we're uh, while we're speak, answering this one. Uh, I have a question from Esther. Um, what have you found to be the most productive partnerships uh, to raise social capital? So this kind of relates to what you you, you answered about the first question. If the School of Architecture was to develop a strategic partnership or partnerships, who would be the ideal partners in your opinion? How can we maximize impact through, through action? Oh, interesting. Um, well, I would say, you know, the kind of organizations that we partner with, you, you know, um, and we're, we're happy to, you know, as, as we've been doing with, with Allison and, and the project that's happening in Willowbrook is really, um, you know, like, go deep in the community. I mean, I think that's how the best work happens is when you, you know, sort of go in the community, listen, like listening is the most important thing. What does the community want and need? And then figure out how um, to, uh, you know, move that project forward. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not easy always to partner and, and so I think kind of building that capacity to really partner in a way that is mutually beneficial um, is definitely a skill set. But I think, um, you know, going in uh, with, uh, you know, this openness to what it, the community wants and what is possible, not having any preconceived, this is what I want to do, but just being responsive to the community is the way to go. I mean, I feel like the project in Willowbrook that we're working on now um, with the team is, is, you know, evolving very beautifully because, because that's what's happening. I mean, uh, there's a um, community leader uh, who's very interested in, in doing the work that uh, is a part of the partnership. And so that that is where it really, you know, makes it really uh, is successful is when you have both partners who want, who have the same values and who come up with the outcomes together. That value uh, piece is so, so important. I mean, we, when we partner with people, that's one of the first things we figure out, is there a value match? Because if there's not a value match, and this goes for the corporate guy too, like figuring out what the value match is, is, um, you know, that's, that's really one of the secrets to a successful project. And then, you know, going forward from there. Oh, and Trudy said long-term community engagement. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's true. Although we, we have like that, that Hyde Park project, we, um, I mean, we went and initially they wanted to kick us out because we had been planning, we wrote a grant and we did all kinds of things and they didn't, they were like, why weren't we involved from, from day one? And so we had to smooth that over. But once, once they saw how we worked, then, you know, the trust was, it was there. And that was like over a couple of months. That wasn't a long-term thing, but now we're actually working with them again. And, you know, I, I could see that being a long-term partnership, but you know, you just gotta, you just gotta bow down. You know, it's really not about going in that like, you know, everything you have to like, just be responsive and how can we be of service? Absolutely. Uh, I think, yeah, I think what, what you've been sharing with us and what you model and what LA Commons models is, a, is, is like the true definition of partnership is that balance between having clarity of intention, but also uh, not coming with preconceived notions or expectations about what the community is supposed to want or do about it. And Zoe uh, as well added a, as a, added a question um, that kind of just looped right in with what you were just responding uh, to Trudy about. Um, but maybe I'll read it just in case you, it, it sparks something else. Uh, so Zoe had said, as someone interested in starting an initiative to start an org, building community legal knowledge and mutual aid in low-income areas, uh, how can nonprofits work to create community and foster and give agency 
to group led community leadership in the long term. So you kind of touched on this, but I kind of, I'm, 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 yeah, in case you have yeah I mean, again, thought. I think it is really, you know, you, you know, finding those people who you share values with and then moving forward based on that, you know, I mean, I think that's, that's the way to do it. And, and again, uh, as I said, coming, coming, you know, to be of service and, and really listening and, you know, working together to create this thing that, that will, um, you know, really meet the needs. If you don't listen, that's not going to happen. Absolutely. Um, okay. I think I'm looking at the time. I think we have time for more. Uh, I have a question from Arusiak uh, saying, really inspiring talk, Karen. Thanks so much for sharing this space with us. Having, uh, having participated in a story circle and doing another one this weekend with Beth, uh, can you talk about how storytelling has assisted in the formulation of transcendent futures? Do you think that it has that capacity to get beyond the structures that exist as a vehicle to transcend them? Well, it's so interesting you asked that question because um, we're working right now with um, uh, this, uh, I, I would call her a futurist. Her name is Johanna Hoffman and she's a fellow here at USC. I forget the name of the fellowship program, but she actually has this tool that will allow people to think like to, to address issues like 50, you know, plus years into the future. And um, one of the tools that she uses is speculative fiction. So really having people read that before they come into the conversation to allow for that, you know, kind of thinking longer term, you know, beyond the immediate needs. Cause it is difficult, I think, for people to get beyond, you know, what, what is right in front of them um, but, you know, we do need to think about those things that are that are coming that, um, you know, maybe because of the time we're in where we're having such, you know, transformative situations like climate change and, you know, all of that, like, sort of bring that knowledge into the space and then allow people to, you know, tell stories in relationship to that knowledge, I think will be an interesting model. Um, you know, I'm not sure how it's going to go, you know, because I do believe there's something to be said for just giving people the chance to tap into their own intuition and to bring that forward uh, without having, um, you know, necessarily any um, direction, like, you know, specific information like that. But, um, you know, we're going to try it, I think, and, and we'll see how it goes. Thank you for that. Um, I, I have a question that's sort of a slightly different direction because I think there are, I know there are a lot of students in the room right now. Um, and I'm curious if you have um, reflections or, or strategies to share about your own approach to education when you went for the degrees that you went for, um, you know, what, what, you know, what were some of the uh, intentions or strategies around why you pursued that degree. I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm just guessing that some of the students in the room might have those kinds of thoughts that they're having about their own educations right now. Well, um, I'm laughing because my undergraduate degree is in accounting. Like, you know, I, the, the opposite side of that growing up period that I had was that I didn't really have any college guidance. So like, I just like, I'm 17, 18 years old, and I'm like, trying to figure out what I want to do. And I actually like the first thing I did, which is so hilarious, was I was an engineering major, an aeronautical engineering major at USC. And then I like I had a class and we had to put together a glider and I couldn't I couldn't do it. So I'm like, this is not the major for me. Like, why I even went in that direction? It was so whimsical. But, you know, like that to me, like that age, like, you know, 20s, it's all about experimentation. Now, after I failed in my first major, I decided, oh, accounting. That sounds like, you know, because I've always been pretty good at math. That sounds like a good, you know, direction. Accounting is not even math. It's like, you know, just uh, debits and credits. But the interesting thing about that, and this is why I believe in magic, is that 
like my accounting degree is the mo is almost the most important degree that I have because I run an organization. So not only am I, you know, focused on, you know, like doing art projects, but you know, I can read a financial statement, I can have conversations about debits and credits. So, you know, I there is I in some ways there is no accidents, I think. You know, like things happen for a reason and then I mean, the reason why I got my MBA was because I was sick of being an accountant, like working in, like I would have to go and I'm an extrovert. I would have to go in the bowels of these companies and, and be reading financial statements and comparing them to, I mean, it was, doesn't that sound like torture? It was. And so, so I got my MBA because I like, I got to escape this. And so the MBA was my escape route. And then I met my husband when I got my MBA. So, you know, like whatever happened, that was valuable, right? And so that like set me up to do other things. And, um, and then um, when I went to Harvard, it was really to like write this plan. It was really to like, it was a transitional thing. And it was like the best transition ever. Oh my God, to get to go to spend a year in Cambridge and not have any responsibilities like, you know, just hang out with people from all over the world, have global, you know, go to talks with global leaders. And, you know, it was, it was awesome. So, um, you know, I mean, there was some uh, logic, but not, not always. And, and I actually really encourage experimentation because, you know, I, I do believe that so much of what the way things come together is serendipity. And, to you know, just give yourself room to like explore and, and find out uh, what it is that really you're passionate about. I've been reading this book right now. It's called um, Future Proof: Nine Nine Strategies for Surviving the Future, you know, or whatever of automation. Like, and and the thing about you know, it's not rocket science. Like, what you have to do is just do exactly what I did. What makes you special? What makes you human? And then focus on that. Like, you know, that is, that's the secret to winning against this technology that, you know, it seems to be, you know, more and more taking over our lives. So I just want to encourage you to um, follow your passion, follow your bliss. That's my, this Joseph Campbell is my hero. If you've never heard of him. And so, um, you know, go for it. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's such an incredible path that you've carved, but also the, the attitude and, and, and perspectives that you've approached it with. Uh, so I'm sure everyone has appreciated hearing that. I think I have one more question, unless somebody else want to, wants to slip one in. Uh, we have one question from Trudy um, that's just asking, how does your work through LA Commons influence your work on the Planning Commission? Oh, hi, Trudy. <laughs> um, Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm like the community person on the, I mean, I'm not the only one because, um, you know, some of my colleagues are oriented this way as well, but, you know, definitely I really, I, I believe in community voice, obviously. And so it really pains me when, um, you know, the community's voices feels like it's being shut down. And one of the things that I want to, um, want to uh, innovate around is just, uh, you know, the amount of time that the community has versus like say a developer and their lawyer and, you know, whatever, to just make sure that, you know, there's a clear understanding because I ultimately believe that community members really know what's best for their community. Now, some, I mean, often there are laws that uh, make it so that, you know, the community can't even, you know, there's really no wiggle room in terms of what is possible uh, when somebody brings a project. It's just by right, they can do it and there's nothing you can do. But, you know, in the cases where there is discretion, I feel like community members should have equal voice at the table right now. For example, neighborhood councils only get three minutes to speak Whereas if, you know, the person who's bringing the project, they can just say how much time they want. So, so you know, it, it doesn't seem fair. I feel like, you know, they're, you know, like 
some, you know, so neighborhood councils can be kind of hit and miss, of course, and I don't want to like offend anybody, but, you know, but, but some neighborhood councils are very sophisticated. And if they're not, to me, the city should be making sure they do know how to deal with planning issues, because those are the most important issues in a neighborhood when you're doing neighborhood work. And so, um, so anyway, I feel like I, um, you know, really represent uh, the people, you know, and, and the focus on what I talked about tonight, you're like, what is going to make a city that where everybody thrives, not just the people who, you know, live on the west side, not just, you know, people who make a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, but everybody thrives. And, uh, and so, um, and I feel like on the planning commission, you know, a lot of times we're looking at buildings, but we're not, it's not about building buildings, it's about building communities. And that really should be what we're focused on. And, you know, and I, I, I don't want to say that the planning department is not doing their job because the staff is exceptionally comp competent. Um, so, you know, it's just a question of, you know, making sure all the voices are heard so that, you know, you come out with the best outcome for each community. Thank you, Karen. Uh, you've been so generous with your time. I wanted to ask one more quick question because as you said at the end of your talk, it's we're still in the midst of this pandemic and there's still so many kinds of challenges that people are facing individually and collectively. So I wanted to ask, uh, what do you do to, to rest and recharge and, and take care of yourself? Oh, that's a nice question. Um, well, my family has really been my, um, my uh, everything during this pandemic, you know, my daughter, we were walking and my daughter said the other day, thank God we had people we wanted to be around during the pandemic, you know, and, and that was really, uh, you know, so true. We've had, we've had a really great time. Um, and, uh, you know, just uh, doing things like we did like a, we, we're still doing it. And, you know, he's an old fat white guy, but he is such an incredible filmmaker, Alfred Hitchcock. We've been watching, we've been catching up on all the Alfred Hitchcock movies, which are so, so incredible. Um, and, uh, and then like we go on hikes together and, you know, we just, it's just been a really, oh, and cooking. Like, oh my God, I love to cook so much. And like during this pandemic, I've just like, you know, I just get in my groove and that's been so uh, restorative. Um, I think, and having dinner together after cooking. So um, anyway, yes, that's been the best. That's been a great side of the pandemic and it's continuing because we're still not back in the office. So, um, you know, hopefully things will uh, shift so that, you know, we are more focused on family time and, you know, just kind of living as opposed to, you know, focusing so much on work. Yeah, those are such uh, wonderful things that you do with your family. Thank you for sharing that a little bit with us. And thank you again, Karen, for uh, again, being so generous through time for sharing all these insights with us. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, for the night. And I hope everyone is well. Um, this lecture series will continue next week. So we hope to see you all soon. And thank you again, Karen. Thank you for having me.